Hello and welcome to today's Hello and welcome to today's program on how do you leverage emotional intelligence to advance your career. My name is Ethan Chazen. I am a New York based organizational development trainer and executive coach. So let's dive right into today's webinar. Emotional intelligence is a incredibly important and a powerful tool for leveraging what's inside yourself to build stronger relationships with yourself as well as other individuals in order to achieve optimal career trajectory and professional development for yourself and those around you. So emotional intelligence is a four step process that you need to go through sequentially. And we do go through these four steps sequentially every second of every day, especially important as we interact with other individuals. And we have to do these four steps sequentially in order to optimize our understanding of ourselves as well as master the art and science of building stronger relationships. So the first step is self-awareness. And if you think about it, self-awareness is nothing more, nothing less, no doubt, than asking yourself, how am I doing? How am I in any given point in time? And in today's global pandemic world that we're all living in, with the constant forces of stress and uncertainty and health risks that surround us, that's critically important. So the first step, self-awareness, is to ask yourself, constantly probe how you're doing. And that first step, self-awareness, leads to a second step called self-management. Self-management is an understanding of how you're doing, a heightened sense of self-awareness that leads to your ability to then regulate those feelings and emotions inside yourself. So in other words, knowing how you're doing, the first step leads to being able to more effectively manage how you're feeling and how you're doing. So once you successfully navigate through the self-management phase, you're now ready to get to what we call social awareness or looking at people around you to gauge how they are doing. And that entails paying attention it's being actively engaged to people around you. And as you do that social awareness stage, step three, you're able to get to the fourth step, which most people mistakenly assume is emotional intelligence, but it's just that ultimate fourth level of understanding called social management. That's the stage in which you are reaching out to other individuals, you're probing how they're doing, you're engaging them to make sure they're okay. That fourth stage social management is actually the fourth step in that fourth step sequential process that we call emotional intelligence. So to have a keener understanding of what emotional intelligence is, it's constantly being receptive to and monitoring the world around you, starting with looking inside yourself to obtain information on yourself and to obtain information on people around you so that you are in a much more heightened sense of self-awareness, no doubt, but also to understand the meaning of your emotions as they're impacting you and also to regulate your emotions so that you can be more effective at working with other individuals. And why is that important to be more effective at working with other individuals? Well, there is a strong correlation between your emotional intelligence and over the long run, your career and professional success. So as you look at Daniel Goleman, who's the godfather of emotional intelligence, and came up with the conceptual framework of emotional intelligence over decades of research. He came to take 25 core competencies that are needed for an understanding of and perfection of emotional intelligence, five clusters of skill set. The first we talked about is self-awareness and self-regulation. Those are the first two stages, but certainly a motivation within ourselves, a drive towards achievement, commitment, initiative, and optimism. So that was a third set of skill cluster. The fourth is you may start to hear or get a sense of this underarching drive of empathy. Empathy is 
to work hard in understanding and developing ourselves and also working hard to serve and develop other people around us. And one way that we as individuals exhibit skills around emotional intelligence is pursuing relationships that are diverse, different, having a heightened sense of political awareness. So that's that fourth cluster of empathy. And the fifth set of skills Daniel Goldman referred to as falling within emotional intelligence are social skills. Now, this has nothing to do with the level of introversion or extroversion. It's the desire that one possesses to influence others, to communicate effectively with others, to pursue meaningful strategies for conflict resolution. So that's the fifth cluster, social, social skills. Now, I want to point out some research conducted by a gentleman by the name of Dilip Jest, who talked about love and wisdom that we pursue as individuals, and that has a positive impact on the world around us, especially in the organizations that we choose to work in. So the six qualities for wisdom that Dilip Jest touched on, which has a direct bearing on our ability to be more emotionally intelligent, is a knowledge of life and what's a life well lived and exercise and good judgment in our relationships and social, pro-social behaviors like empathy, like having compassion for others, altruism, a sense of doing good in the world, the sense of right and wrong and of ultimate justice and fairness. And Another quality Dilip just talked about was an insight into ourselves and our actions. So that gets back to emotional intelligence when I mentioned the first stage of self-awareness. How am I doing? How am I feeling? Am I okay? No, I'm not okay. Okay, let me understand why. Which leads to that second step of self-management is being able to more effectively regulate how we're doing so that we can then be in a better position to have more meaningful social engagements or social interactions. Relativism, Philip Jess talked about as a quality for wisdom. Relativism is an understanding that we don't know sometimes what the truth ultimately is. And therefore it makes our sense of exploration that much more critically important. How does this manifest for you and others around you in the pursuit of career optimization and professional development. It's those people who are proverbial lifetime learners. And a sense of decisiveness. There's a wisdom to be gained from making decisions that are well-intentioned, no doubt, but also well-informed, meaning you're the kind of person who fights your natural knee-jerk reaction to make decisions, maybe without complete information or without input from others. There's an old saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So decisiveness, according to the six qualities for wisdom, decisiveness is taking input from others. It leads to effective collaboration, team building, and as a leader, more democratic, participative engagement of the people around you. So what are the implications for emotional intelligence? We know that people with emotional intelligence are gritty. They can overcome trying and demanding times like we find ourselves in now in a global pandemic. They persevere, people do, with high levels of emotional intelligence in the face of nearly seemingly un insurmountable adversity. Also, emotional intelligence creates options for ourselves. If you think about it, those of us who strive to enhance our emotional intelligence, find yourselves going down different paths. So instead of just thinking things as black, white, I only have one option. People who are emotionally intelligent ask, if this happens, then what? If I'm faced with such and such a situation, then what are my options? What does this imply? That to be effective in emotional intelligence, we need to be critical thinkers, we can leverage creative problem solving, we are more likely to engage others on productive team constructs, and it also enables us to do what's called communication. These are the heart and center, the soul of what we call soft skills, non-technical professional skills development. So why does all of this matter, emotional intelligence? It matters because it has a powerfully direct bearing on yours, mine, all employees' performance, 
and productivity. It allows us to gauge what are more appropriate workplace responses for us to initiate. It also lends itself to us having more constructive, productive relationships in the workplace, but also in our lives. It leads to physical and mental state of a heightened sense of well-being. And that's a pretty critically important statement as we're all navigating through this fear and anger and uncertainty and this sense of prevailing overarching doom that we may be we may find ourselves dealing with in this global pandemic. So from the organization standpoint, if you're somebody who's building a team, building a business, the impact of emotional intelligence is 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 several fold. First of all, it increases employee performance, which makes the organization more successful. It reduces turnover. People who have a higher level of emotional intelligence are more engaged in their work. It leads to less employee withdrawal or pulling inside themselves as opposed to being engaged with others around them, lower absenteeism, greater sense of employee citizenship. That's some powerful stuff, but to get there, to get there for ourselves and to help train other people, emotional intelligence is built on this thing called trust. And we know that trust is not given randomly. Trust is earned. Trust is a very powerful commodity and it becomes much more than a commodity. Once we nurture it in ourselves and others, it becomes the bonding agent of organizational success. So it requires you and me and everybody around us to do this thing called emotional intelligence well, to constantly be going through introspection to say, what am I good at? What do I stand to benefit from improving? How am I predisposed to react to others? What am I feeling? And how do I impact others? That's the sum total of the, probe, the, the impact on emotional intelligence on ourselves and others. It requires us to observe ourselves, honestly, and to constantly be putting our finger on the pulse of how we impact others and to think about our interactions that we have and what triggers us. It's a sense of heightened consciousness. Imagine that you can see yourself, and I want you to think about this as it pertains to yourselves, where you are right now in your careers and where you plan to go. It is a direct bearing on your career trajectory. What do you need to do right now at this point in time to build a heightened sense of consciousness for yourself that's going to impact you, others around you, in your personal lives, in your professional lives? What do you need to do to be more conscious of others? And how is this going to help you be more influential on the lives of others? It's getting back to what I said before, that first stage of emotional awareness is how am I enables you as you constantly monitor that to have stronger sense of emotional self-management or regulation. So you may have heard of it as surface acting or putting on a brave face, a stoic demeanor, or even when you're not okay, training yourself through mind exercise, pattern behavior discipline of putting on a brave face. And that will enable us to avoid dangerous situations where we're inclined to just knee-jerk react openly and vehemently in a heightened sense of emotional danger where we lash out or we vent. We know people in good moods make better decisions, they're more creative, and they're more effective at motivating others. So aha, that's a critically powerful tool for leadership cultivation. Emotional states affect our levels of client engagement and customer service. So getting good at it, you know, there's an old saying, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. It requires active listening, which let me just tell you now, active listening sounds like a great concept. Active listening is one of the hardest things that we can do is to listen to everything around people around us. It requires, it demands that we care about other people and we treat our employees better than any other group of individuals, even our clients. So if you need to frame that as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a business unit leader, if you need to frame that, treat your employees like clients and treat your clients like employees. 
So pick up on nonverbal cues. We know that there's three ways to communicate, the written word, the spoken word, and the nonverbals. The nonverbals are the most powerful and effective means of gauging how other people are doing. So that third step of emotional intelligence is social awareness. Here's a little kind of tip that I train in my executive coaching practice to help other people get good at emotional intelligence. Imagine yourself going into every single conversation or engagement you have an interaction with somebody else with a willingness to have your position on a particular subject changed. It doesn't mean you waffle or you never are decisive. That's not what I'm saying. It means being predisposed to go into every social interaction with a willingness to meet somebody where they are and have an oppositional viewpoint something that's opposed to what your natural inclination is to be in your consideration set. This is called self-introspection. It's called constantly looking inside ourselves to gain greater understanding and knowledge, to have a positive impact on others as we're in the present. And to be present means you have to avoid the gazillion daily in, intrusions, whether it's email, busy work, things that clog up our inbox of busy work because there's this fallacy that we human beings operate under that busy work is productive. Work-life balance is a falsity. There's no such thing. There's this false narrative around work-life balance that I can create these Chinese firewalls, these silos between what I'm doing at work and what I'm doing at home. We know that both spill over into one, and one another so it means to effectively control the amount of awareness and investment we apply to our home life and our work life that leads to a lack of control so things that come up that seemingly are urgent we need to constantly be vigilant by prioritizing the things that are most important to us not just in the short term but taking a longer view perspective. And so I wanna get back to something I alluded to before, nonverbal communications, body language. Pay attention to now in the world we're living in with COVID-19 and virtual distance, social distancing and virtual as opposed to face-to-face -face meetings. This is gonna get harder to gauge, but nonetheless, you can still do this virtually. Pay attention to cues, pay attention to people's body language. Nonverbal communication is the sending and the receiving of nearly entirely visual messaging. And when we're on the lookout for them, things like people touching, body posture, facial expressions, eye contact, and you want to look out for micro communications. Micro communications are those split second, very revealing, but easy to hide or not notice expressions, things like when somebody starts talking to you, excuse me, when, some, when you start talking to somebody, their like knee-jerk reaction is, that first is a micro expression. You wanna be aware of people seemingly not aware of opening up the window into their soul of how their true feelings are. And you can't do that. You can't master that unless you're attenuated or plugged into, tuned into those kind of communications. Mirroring is when somebody's talking to you, if they're leaning back, you lean back. If they're leaning in, you lean in. You mirror their body language, which researchers say puts you and them at greater ease. Leaning in conveys interest. Even if you're not really interested, but you're just practicing it, it makes the other person believe that, you know what? I think that you're kind of into me, so to speak eye rolling, yawning, all these things that whether intended or not convey, I don't trust you, I don't like you, I'm emotionally disconnected to you. So pick it up, pick up the body language cues. Understand when people are doing things, they exhibit certain types of traits and characteristics. Body language also implies a almost cultural component of space, American space. An acceptable space differential is three feet. Now, again, social interactions limited in the, in the global pandemic. It's more virtual. But when we get back to new normal of being able to interact with people face to face, not face to screen, we'll be able to take advantage of that. Even reading the emotions from people based on their facial expressions, that's ways that we can do that. So definitions and affect is a big bucket 
of feelings that people experience, call them emotions or moods. An emotion is an intense feeling that you or somebody else is directing at somebody else. A mood is a little bit less intense than an emotion. And often there's no trigger. It's just a pervasive sense of, let's say, malay or feeling depressed. What's the matter, Ethan? Oh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm in one of my moods as opposed to an emotion, which is more intense. So that's what I want to point out. Emotions are human elements. So don't think that emotions make us more or less rational. In fact, people falsely assume that being emotional makes us irrational or incapable of making having sound judgment. Having emotions and conveying and depicting emotions makes us more rational. So we all have needs. Going back to Abraham Maslow and his decades of research into the five levels of human need. We understand right, right now in a global pandemic, water, food, breathing, that is the most elemental basic physiological need. And as we are able to navigate life's many challenges and move up to the next levels of need, we get more heightened sense of emotional intelligence. So safety, okay, a sense of body safety, resources, job. As we have safety, we move up to love and belonging, a sense of interconnectedness, of intimacy, family. Then we move up the next level to esteem, in the sense in my own sense of self-worth and my respect for others and my being respected by others leads to the most heightened, according to Abraham Maslow's sense of need, is self-actualization. It's a sense of heightened morality, a sense of what's doing right in the world. Here's a critical point that Maslow discovered. As each of us encounter life's many uh, tragic and stressful life events that can tend to knock us down, we're constantly having to readjust our lives and ourselves and pick ourselves back up and move, march back up the hierarchy of needs to achieve that fifth highest sense of ultimate manifestation in ourselves called self-actualization. Now, self-actualization is great, but from a needs and serving others perspective, I want to share with you the five levels of need. So in all of our relationships, we human beings are relatively lazy. We rely on the superficial, easy ways of satisfying others' needs that don't lead to deeper, emotionally intelligent relationships. So the first is when you're interacting with somebody and they tell you what they need, that's a stated need. And most people just live our lives serving others based on what they tell us they need. And that's a shame because they're, that's only the first and most easily readily apparent of five levels of need. So the four others, let's go through them. When somebody tells you what they need, understand that that's often not important. It's what they mean under the underlying real need. So you ask questions for clarification. I hear what you're saying. That's interesting. When you say that, do you mean that? What are you really asking for? That's that second level of obvious need, the real need. But what's missing is that whole deeper level hidden below the surface level set of three additional needs. So oftentimes what somebody tells you is just a very small fraction of what they're really needing out of the relationship and that's unstated. And how do you get there? Through cultivating a more meaningful relationship over time based on trust and empathy and everything positive that comes from meaningful relationships, they'll start to reveal additional things that they need as you keep probing them in being a servant master. So you, they start to reveal things to you that they didn't typically or feel initially that they could trust you on. So they start to probe and get more insight into their unspoken or unstated needs to the point at which through your relationship, you may find yourself in a relationship saying this to them or they say to you, say, wow, you would do that for me? That's a delight need. And that requires unstated delight in what's the final deepest level of need fulfillment called secret needs that requires relationships based on empathy. And so you find over years and years of building strong relationships with your employees, your customers, your peers, sometimes if you get into that really beautiful relationship, somebody will finally open up to you what they're looking for because up until that point, they wouldn't even reveal it to themselves. So this is a state in nature or in humanistic relationship cultivation called mutual symbiosis. When both parties 
derive maximum benefit from being in relationship with each other. That's between an employee and an employee, an employee and their employer. That's a powerfully state of existence, and that's built on a really strong culture. So you ask, I coach and train organizations. Do they deliver to their people a sense of belonging? Have they built a culture of all of this fantastic emotional intelligence where people are allowed to share their beliefs, ideologies, their vision, their mission, their core values? Are people working towards a sense of individualistic and team-based and organizational accomplishment? Do they offer a fair livelihood and a chance to have career mobility? It's engaging your people, motivating them, recognizing, rewarding them. In short, it's a compassionate workplace culture. So we lose emotional intelligence in an increasing virtual world and also a global pandemic where we're all forced to work and live online. So conflict is something that comes up. We don't always get to choose how conflict appears in our life, but we do get to choose how we respond to it. There are four kinds of conflict. Those are called win, lose, lose, win, 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 lose. And when is it appropriate? We'll talk about that in a subsequent training session. So for now, we wrap up today's webinar on emotional intelligence. I hope you derive enjoyment and also keen insights into what we discussed. And I want to share with you my contact details. I'd love the opportunity to speak with you in more detail about your personal career and professional development needs, your organization's needs for employee development through training. The best way to reach me is my email, ethan at the chasergroup.com or by phone. You can always call me on my cell phone, 917-239-5571. Thank you, and here's to your professional career success.